When I went overseas in, uh, in, in the 2000s, um, I noticed how much arbitration was being used uh, in, in, in international business, in international commerce. And of course, in the last 10, 20 years, we've seen a, a very big increase in, in international trade. Uh, we've seen a great liberalisation in, in, in trade and in, in companies doing business around the world. And in fact, companies from different countries um, doing business in third countries through joint ventures and other commercial enterprises. And um, it's logical that in, in those kinds of transactions, uh, the parties are going to look to uh, some neutral form of dispute resolution to include in their contracts. And uh, international arbitration was the uh, logical, logical choice. International arbitration provides a number of uh, benefits for parties over and above litigation. Of course, if you're doing business uh, in another country, you're not going to want to use the courts of that country for your, to resolve your disputes. Um, uh, you would like to find a neutral venue. It's difficult to find a, a neutral court, or it has been difficult to find a neutral court to deal with a dispute. So these private forms of uh, international dispute resolution, such as international commercial arbitration, grew as a result of that. We had um, colleagues in our other offices who were very willing to introduce themselves to our, our, our team. And so very quickly, there were lots of ways that we were able to interact with our other offices, whether it was um, face-to-face um, off-sites in other uh, countries or partners and lawyers coming to our office and really introducing some of the developments and learnings that they had. So there was plenty of opportunity to do that so that uh, very quickly our staff felt part of the Clifford Chance um, network. Um, and we've really introduced quite early on the mobility. Um, part of the, I think, what marks our practice is we encourage mobility between offices because that gives our lawyers um, exposure to different uh, markets and experiences. Um, so we've had in our office in Sydney, lawyers from you know London, um, New York, Europe, uh, Asia, and likewise we sent our lawyers uh, to those different markets and quite early in their career. The other thing that we talk that I think is talked about a lot in terms of the way law practice might be changing is around internationalisation, and and the need for students to have a better sense of that, to have international experiences and around languages. And I, I agree with that, but I also think it might come in a different way as well. And that is not just because students might be working or graduates might be working for large law firms and, and therefore having international experience or working with clients from other jurisdictions, but it may well be in the future that we will have a much more mobile workforce than we do now. We obviously have one now. Students go off to work in the UK, in uh, to New York, and, and increasingly to China and so forth, which is great. But it may be the different types of ways in which a lawyer works in the future might mean that you're not so bound by the jurisdiction to which you're admitted. And so having um, a facility to work in other international um, contexts might actually become quite important. And I would think particularly Asia here, I think we really have to get our students thinking about Asia and it's not just about Europe and North America. There's a lot more education these days in international arbitration at university level. So that you're looking at um, generally international business and as part of that, international dispute resolution, international arbitration. So those lawyers who are coming through law schools will be able to be a bit more conscious of what to, be a, what to advise parties in relation to uh, their dispute resolution clauses. Um, for many years, those clauses, and I think they still are, they've been known as the midnight clause, that you don't think about a dispute resolution mechanism till the very end of a negotiation, um, which is not always the best thing when, uh, when things come to, um, uh, when, when problems arise, because not enough thought is given at the drafting stage to um, where you seat your arbitration, what kinds of um, institutions are available, what are the procedural rules that those institutions have, what could be, what sort of dispute might you have, what would be an appropriate way to resolve it, where are you going to get those opportunities, and, and so on.